name is Mark Burek, and today we have a very special guest for you. But before we get to that, just have a few announcements. Today is Wednesday, June 22nd. That's the day that we're filming. We just released our second set of dates for camps coming up this fall. If you don't know about our camps, they're seven-day beach volleyball training vacations where you just get to connect with new friends, current pro players, amazing. And you get to party and play volleyball and train. I think we separate ourselves in the idea that uh, we really, really pride ourselves in helping you become a better player and a better coach uh, through our camps and clinics. If you ever want us to come to your hometown for a clinic, please reach out, shoot an email to support at betteratbeach.com. Uh, we can send our coaches to you for a coaching or a player's clinic. And we have loads of online resources, uh, online courses for passing, setting, hitting, arm swing, we have a tremendous 60-day max vertical workout program if you ever want to upgrade your body and your efficiency in terms of physical fitness. And we have other resources for coaches as well, such as uh, 53 practice plans. But all of that is available on betteratbeach.com should you ever want to check it out. We are here to help you get better at beach. On to today's show. She as a USA Volleyball and FIVB coaching certifications. She is a certified lecturer for the International Olympic Academy and Women in Sports Organization, as well as a fair play and sport management company uh, for the Guatemalan Olympic Committee. She is an entrepreneur. She started a number of programs and she founded the first ever private beach volleyball club in Central America, which is wild. She is also the founder of Dig It, where she coached beach volleyball players from Central America. And from 2017 through 2018, she was the director of Coast Beach Volleyball Club. And she qualified for the FIVB World Championships in The Hague, Netherlands in 2015, becoming the first Guatemalan team to participate in the world championships. She is currently the associate head coach at TCU, and she has helped guide the Horn Frogs to end of season rankings in all three seasons, 2019, 2020, and 2021, all top 20 rankings. She has helped orchestrate the rise of the program to its first NCAA appearance, tournament appearance in 2021, and she was named the AVCA Assistant Coach of the Year in that process. Laundry list, mouthful to get through your list of accomplishments. Maho Arayana, my friend, my competitor, my fellow travel mate, what's up? Hello, Mark. I'm so excited to be in your podcast and to see you again. It's been a while since we were like our ventures in Norsecas. I don't even remember when that was, but that was a while ago. So super happy to see you. Do you miss playing on Norsecas? Uh, yes and no. You know, <laughs> it was for so those, fun. For, but it's it was, so fun. It was sometimes it was a struggle. So that, you know, I don't miss that, but I for sure miss the people. I We had so much fun and learned so much about different cultures and the game and everything and just how we all were trying to to make a living out of beach volleyball so i don't know it was just a great experience for sure so you you're born in guatemala right mm -hmm. and then when did you move to the u.s i moved to the u.s nine years ago so i moved in june 2013. how is your english so perfect uh, I am super grateful that my parents, uh, you know, like cared a lot about our education and we went to, um, me and my sisters went to a, an American school. Mm. So basically uh. you graduate from like two, de two degrees, you know, one in Spanish, one in English. So high school in Spanish, that's so high school in English and bachillerato in Spanish. So since I was in preschool, instead of, you know, like how here you have just like Spanish class, right? Mm. We had half day of Spanish, half day of English. So I got to, you know, like wow. I got to take math and English and Spanish. I got to get uh, to take like history, like our history plus American history, you know, literature in Spanish plus 
American literature or English literature, sorry, and stuff like that. So grammar in Spanish, grammar in English, spelling. Like, so I got like everything I had in Spanish, I took it in English as well. So that helped me a lot. And I think just moving here and just coaching and, you know, making sure that I was able to communicate the best I could and practicing, it just got better and better. And I still like, you know, sometimes I say things that I feel like people don't understand, (laughs) but you know, I I do my best. (laughs) Nice. I I love hearing about those, like the, um, the bilingual schools or not even bilingual schools, but when you hear of uh, like an American school just placed in another country or just an English speaking school, I'm, I know that those exist here in the U S for other languages. I've never been able to be a part of one, but I, I, you know, I, I do have a little, a little app, you know, Duolingo and the, <laughs> my wife is practicing her Spanish and uh, yeah. I'll, I'll keep up. So uh, that was, being able to speak a little bit of Spanish was so valuable on the North yeah. mm-hmm. Oh man. That, yeah, because you have so many, like mostly, you know, the refs, the tournament director, uh, you know, because back when we used to go, it was Arnaldo, right? Like it was not, like now it's a Canadian. So mm. it's probably easier, but yeah, I, I, I was, you know, most of the time I was translator for a lot of the American and Canadian teams, you know, <laughs> even, uh, I don't, I remember like Kendra, Kendra one time she had like a condition in her skin and she couldn't play without like being all covered and we're in Mexico was so hot and they oh. did it. They didn't want to let her play. So we needed to explain the whole condition. So yeah, it was, yeah. A lot of stories of that. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. Uh, how long has it been since you've been in a since you've been in a tournament? Last time I last year I played was twenty sixteen, if I'm not mistaken. Wow. So yeah, yeah when, when that was a while. That was, a while. So, that was so my last year doing like North Vegas heavily uh, was your probably your last year doing competing. Yeah. What's the transition like going from playing to? to no longer playing or competing do you feel like life opened up for you or do you feel like you had to cut a big slice of it out i think like you know like as a as a player as a competitor as an athlete you know you have all this expectations right about Mm. where are you going what is supposed to look like you know like your timeline and all that stuff and you know sometimes things go great sometimes things go terrible right Mm -hmm. and I just think like I went in through a process of self-discovery uh for a whole year Uh, I worked with a life coach and I was working a lot on like trying to qualify for you know for Tokyo for that was that that time uh and was it Tokyo no it was Rio I think I don't no, I don't know. I don't remember, but it the was Olympics. one of the Olympic classes, right? Um, Olympic cycle. So I was like trying to focus on that, but at the same time working on me on a lot of things that I needed to to work on, like self worth and kind of having more faith and surrendering to to things that I couldn't control. So I think like I was training really hard then I got injured I hurt my shoulder like one of the many injuries I've had you know I tore my labor on my left uh I was ambidextrous so that kind of yeah and now then I was just an average of five four <laughs> undersized girl <laughs> I was like nothing special <laughs> so I think and also you know in Guatemala it's always hard you know to find a partner this and that and it's just it was just a constant struggle and you know and I was working too a lot at like running a beach volleyball club is not easy there's a lot of things so I think by the time that I realized that I was like being really good and and you know like and coaching and working with kids Mm. uh and like all this stuff like happened you know and then like opportunities showed up to work on different schools that I you know had some conversations and I was I think I was in a good headspace where I could really intuitively know what was right for me and what was the right timing of things right yeah so just it was a year that I just surrendered to 
to the things that were good for me and just let it play its curse and just give all in to the things that they felt right. Mm. And it was did so they much- feel right or did they feel easy and like fitting? Because I think sometimes in life people, yeah. you know, I'm sure that the opportunities to coach at schools and to work for different people and start clubs and start companies, I'm sure those opportunities were always there. And maybe you just weren't listening or you would have had to fit it into whatever you had. But I think sometimes in life we, we're, we're at a moment where like something fits perfectly, but we just push it aside and we keep going, you know, you, you ignore it so that you can do what you think or what you want to do. So for you, you know, did it, did it fit? Was it, was it just the, the right time? Did yeah, you, you use the word surrender, which I think is pretty interesting. I think I was ready. Like I was ready and like, I was in the right headspace that I knew what I was worth. You know, mm. I knew that, uh, that I had the, how do you say, like the experience and I knew that I was prepared. Right. And I, and I knew that if I wasn't prepared, I knew that I could, you know, like the opportunities would present for me to be prepared or to learn and, or the right people. Uh, So I just think like everything kind of aligned, but it was because I let it happen. Most of the time, like you're so trapped into how things should look or how people should be instead of creating a space where people can be there themselves and people can you know provide you what they can provide you and what they can give you and how they can love you and how they can i don't know help you to be better instead of always trying to for it to be your way and i think that helped you know for sure yeah. i don't know if i'm if you, you know, kind of like understand what I'm trying to say. Well, how, how do you weigh that against the friction? Because the heroes, you know, in our life or that we look at, they go against the grain, against the flow of what's happening to them. And they stand in the face of, you know, all doubt, all pressure, everything that, that's going wrong for them. And then they somehow turn the course. You know, I think some heroes end up in a position because that's what they were given like in in some movies but how do you measure surrendering 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 to what's being given you and 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 what you know maybe god or the universe or energies are are sending you versus like no i have to fight against this now because i know what's what's right for me yeah i I totally understand what you're saying and i agree 100 percent. the thing is like there's two things that are very different i never stopped fighting for what i wanted i've never have and i never will what i stopped doing is forcing you know Mm -hmm. so that was what i kind of like what the difference of one thing and another because sometimes like if i didn't fight and if if i didn't force it i felt i was not doing enough ever or i felt that i was not caring enough or i don't know like something so it was more about allowing myself to that having fun is okay you know feeling peace is okay i don't have to be in the grind all the time but i'm still giving my all you know i'm still giving my all so just recognizing that when it's like i'm fighting for this that i really want and when is when i'm forcing it and it's not right for me have you used that time those transitions with your current players to directly translate any specific lessons you know to guide them yeah that's one of the beauties of my job i get to do that every day and i love it and i think it's one of the my whys you know that i'm i'm there for those girls not only for volleyball but for life you know just for me like i was super clear on what my why it was my my, what my purpose was long time before ago even before I got here to the United States and like I just wanted to support youth to have better opportunities throughout sport right and to be better people and to be better leaders of a community better leaders of a family of a team like whatever it is you know just and I just feel that I'm on the spot every day with a bunch of of girls that I love and that I care for more than 
a player, right? So it is like I have to be one of the probably the hardest things as a collegiate coach is to for you to really take care of yourself, you know, of, of your body, your health and your your mind and, and make sure that you're you're well rested, you're well, you know, like even if you're working a lot, like not burnt out or stuff like that. So you can really be there for them because if not, you know, like the stress can just overwhelm you and, and just the competitiveness, which, you know, I'm still super competitive, but at the same time, you know, it's very important for me and for Hector that the girls are feel loved, feel, you know, that feel that they can't communicate with us, that they have a safe, safe space for them to, to, to share what they're going through and stuff like that. So yeah, hmm. every day. How do you, how do you guys do that? Do you do it with open meetings, one-on-one -on -one meetings, or just a constant repetition of we're here for you when you guys, when you guys need it? Cause I think a lot of maybe club directors and juniors coaches and even fellow NCAA coaches, you know, with like the rules and, and, and guidelines of sometimes you, you absolutely cannot have communication with people or there are certain barriers. So how do you guys specifically let your players know that they are cared for safe and that you have their back? Basically repeating it consistently, you know, like being, you know, Coaching a college team, you have to be strict. You have to be have to have a lot of rules. You know, you're creating a culture. You know that a competitive culture, right? And and managing a big group of people that, you know, it has to work. It has to flow. It has to work. It has to. We have to compete, right? But at the same time, like just constantly reminders to them individually and as a group. You know, like whatever you need, I'm here for you. It's important for you guys to communicate with us communicate with each other and just like making sure that not, you know, not only here, but like anywhere that you're at, you know, like make sure that everyone has their support system and they know that they can reach out to someone. Right. And, and just for us to be available and generate that trust both ways, right. That they can trust us and we can trust them. Uh, and it's, it's, it's worked out. It has worked out like really, really well. And, you know, there's, you know, the, everyone mostly you know young young adults go through a lot of stuff yeah. and and sometimes we can help sometimes we can't but the only thing we can do is like we can be there for them right yep absolutely and before we get to some volleyball talk mm -hmm. what's the vibe like on current ncaa bus rides i mean for for me what was this now 15 years ago i mean like the bus rides were fun and everybody was constantly talking to each other. We played the stupid game where we hit each other in the face with a ball. Um, but you know, I, now I look at like airports and everything with smartphones and I can see it, like teams staying in their phone, not talking to each other. So what's, what's the vibe in NCAA bus rides like nowadays? Well, it is, there's a lot of, you know, that they're on the phone or sleeping and stuff like that. Uh, but also, you know, sometimes when you have to rent vans and, you know, you have your own van with like a group of like, I don't know, six girls or whatever. It's so fun. You know, <laughs> like blasting music, you always have like somebody fighting to be the DJ and they're just like the quiet ones. And so our fun, our team is so fun that you, I have a great time and, and yeah, I, I don't like the the smartphone thing, you know, for meals and stuff like that. We try to avoid that. And, but, uh, but no, it's, it's still fun. I think I travel with another team and they were so quiet. And I told them like, Hey, like what's wrong with you guys? You know, <laughs> our girls are just, you know, there's always like someone making fun of someone or just like they're dancing a lot of TikTok, a lot of TikTok. <laughs> uh, so yeah. <laughs> It's fun. It's fun. It's fun. Nice. Okay, cool. I'm glad that that team vibe is, <laughs> is still around. Yes, There's a, yeah. I've got a few favorite like partners that I travel with that are just super entertaining on their own. And uh, I always remember stories of like Todd and Phil just 
literally not talking to each other for entire road trips because they just both enjoyed like reading <laughs> and movies <laughs> and but they they did it together so you don't have to be silly and communicate it was just fun yeah, you know? yeah it is fun and it's something that we you know like we try to tell them like hey you know like i know everyone wants to be on their phone you know for meals and stuff like that and you're like yeah but then you're going to really miss this time you know like when you are older and you say like i should have just really enjoyed my time with my teammates mm -hmm. because it is fun it is fun all right so maho what's it like growing up and trying to be a volleyball player in guatemala Ooh, you really want to go into that absolutely <laughs> okay absolutely you know beaches indoor club systems politics tell me everything okay. everything that won't get you in trouble with the government <laughs> no, I'm, <good. laughs> I'm an american citizen now. <laughs> <laughs> okay so um i started playing really young indoor because my parents played or they, they played indoor, they met like, you know, playing sports. So I, I played a different sports when I was a kid. Um, and then I chose volleyball, I loved it. It was just rough on the sense that, you know, there's not that many support, right? And money and just like the system is completely different, right? Mm. Um, I was blessed enough to have different coaches from different countries. So my first coach was, Peruvian. Then I had like three different Japanese coaches. Then I had like oh. four different Cubans. <laughs> yeah. So I learned a lot from different, you know, styles of volleyball. This was all indoor. Uh, I was even in Guatemala that people are short. I was still always the shortest on the team. <laughs> so that was rough as well. Uh, in school, you know, it's not that back home you can't, there's, the system is not like here that you can have an education throughout sport, like a better education. So people think it's just a hobby and, you know, like it's not, yeah. you're going to not make a living of it ever. So do you have school teams? Of, you have school teams. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. You and have school teams. I mean, you started the first beach volleyball club. Do you yeah. have a, a private club system and how does that relate with the federation? No no private club system no okay and so like, you can't be like an entrepreneur who wants to start a, a business and and coach and run teams and tournaments and stuff uh -oh. huh, like there's okay. a league but it's just like the like it's open for everyone you know it's not a youth league or a or a, you know like junior club league or stuff like that no no it doesn't work like that so almost everything is you know the federation is in control so okay. that's where everything is just weird. Uh, so for me, for example, to travel, beach volleyball is super new, right? I was like, when I started playing beach, like I didn't have a clue about beach volleyball. We didn't have a coach or anything. I just kind of, I saw some invitations coming in through the Federation about beach volleyball tournaments. And I was like, oh, um, can I see that, you know, the secretary and she showed me and but like every time it went to the, you know, to the, how do you call it? The people, um, I forgot. Well, they, they always look at them and they say they declined the invitation because, you know, they didn't have like a budget or funds or, or, or team or whatever. Mm -hmm. So I just started like fundraising and just making sure like, Hey, like I told like our, our president of the federation and the manager was just like hey i know this invitation came through and i don't I, i'm not asking for money or anything i just want to for you to say yes and i'll fundraise whatever and i'll go like you know and we'll go yeah but you don't have a coach it doesn't matter so whenever like we went to a, a, an international tournament it was just like sitting down and watching teams practice and what do they do you know like just being super oh curious. wow yeah okay so it was so new to you guys that like they yeah. didn't know how to say yes because they thought certain people needed to be in place and they didn't have them and then when you finally convinced them <laughs> like no nah, it'll just be me i'm fine we'll go yes we'll go we'll find like something you know like sponsors or whatever and that's another thing you know i i 
I majored in marketing. So I kind of knew, you know, a little bit of how to promote myself and, and talk and stuff like that. So I did a bunch of that. Uh, also, school was hard because, like, professors didn't give me permission. And at that time, I was going, you know, to college, right? Mm -hmm. Then I played indoor and I played beach. So I had two practices a day. Plus, mostly, you know, indoor was my main thing because I was captain of the national team for a long time. Nice. So then, five four captain of the national team. What the heck? Yes, I awesome. don't know. I was an outside hitter. I don't know how, but yeah, something <laughs> like that. Um, I have a story about that too. It was like so then, and I worked part time. So hmm. it was like my days were super long for me, like to do my conditioning. It was four a.m. in the stadium. You know, go to the track four thirty a.m. in the morning and just get the lift in you know, work, then get a beach practice uh, after lunch and then go to school. And then at night, like from 7.30 to 10, practice indoor. So it was just a lot. And Brutal. yes, and with no like true guidance. So that was, it was, it was super brutal. And, but that's, you know, like I knew that I had to do a lot for me to be able to to play, right? Yeah. And then on top of that, you have your parents and your friends telling you you're completely crazy. You're out of your mind. You know, you're not gonna leave from volleyball. Like every freaking family gathering that I went, I had an uncle, an aunt, my grandparent, like any like anyone had like this like our conversation with me about that I was wasting my life, that I was, you know, like I was never going to make a living out of sport, that I should focus on on school and work and stuff like that. So we're we talking about I, force versus fit. Yeah. So then I, fight. Exactly, exactly. So then I was like, you know what? Like, I'm just going to stop going to all this social events, you know, because it was so annoying. Mm. And it was, yeah, it was force fight and force like that was my life for a long time so that was that was so hard and also you know just like and then trying to get like coaches coming so we had some Cuban coaches which they were the first Cuban coach that we had he was like I don't know like 70 years old like really <laughs> old like like or more you know like basically he was like a very good indoor coach Apparently, like not apparently, he was like you know, like the three-time Olympic medalist. For right. Indoor, he was part of that coaching staff. We had another one like that too, but like kind of like when Cuba, like they were not, you know, young to coach for their national teams. They kind of send them to like our countries. Okay. So I learned a lot from him, but at the same time, it was like, okay, you just came here almost to retire, right? So. <laughs> What do we do? Uh, so that was rough, but at least we had a coach. And then we had another coach, which he was, he was awesome. I loved him, but at the same time, he would have never like fight for us for money or anything or for opportunities. So we still had to do that ourselves. We went to a lot of like every year, went to training camps to Cuba. And then I started coming to California to train, you know, like paying my trip and just trying to get, you know, a coach. This is wild that yeah. you self-funded yeah. everything. And, and not, not I, like, it's not only like, oh, yeah, you know, I, I, I packed bags at the grocery so that I could pay for my club membership. You were figuring out how and where to get coaches, how and where you could travel, how and where you could pay for travel. Mm -hmm. And with nobody leading the way or showing you what to do or how to do it you just like made up stuff like i guess i should go to california because there's volleyball players there yeah <sighs> it was it was just like and my parents always supported me like with sports not they there was a point that they, that they started like hey you know what like you have to grow up right and then i was but they never gave me like money you know like to pay for a coach even to pay for shoes like for my if i wanted like a cool like mizuno or asics like shoes to play indoor like they said like okay if you want them like you just you know you, you can get them so i was 
I was like trying to find a way to make money to 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 buy my stuff, you know, the the things that I wanted. So, you know, I just learned since I was yeah. young, I think, to to find a way to get there. And but yeah, it was constant struggle, and then trying to get the media involved so our sport was promoted. But then the media was like only like shooting you know, like our bikini bottoms and stuff like that. Nice. When they called, I had to have like this conversations with sponsors, like, no, like, yeah, you can give me all this money, but if you're going to promote only our bottoms, I yeah. don't want it, you know, like this is not what it is. And just Good kind of like, yeah. educating people like media, um, sport organizations and whoever about beach volleyball. And that's how I started the club too. But the club was mostly... What I did for the club, when I started the club is I hired a PR company that helped me because I already had like sponsors and stuff for me, like as a player, but I wanted to educate the community of beach volleyball, you know, like kind of like promote the sport. So yeah. I went with tons of like interviews, TV, newspapers, magazines, everything to promote beach volleyball in Guatemala. And yeah. So let's say I'm all right. Better at Beach wants to sponsor you uh, as a as a Guatemalan athlete, or they don't. Let's let's say you know I'm just sitting there, and you know that I'm a company. Mm -hmm. How do you open that conversation? Because I know that we have a lot of listeners that are thinking like, how do I get sponsors for my leagues for my tournaments? How do mm -hmm. I get you know uniforms paid for for my my junior thing? And there's uh, probably a big segment who are listening who are thinking how do I get my tournaments paid for? So how do you approach a company? I think first I, I really created like a really cool presentation about everything and making myself like exposed to different, you know, like media programs, like whatever, you know, like just try to be there like everywhere. So my face will pop out or, or I could talk or I could speak wherever I could. So I can, I could add that into you know like a sponsor plan and stuff like that so i have this many appearances and this and this and this Does so wait. not yet because um so the first step for you is to just get speaking roles that was what i did first uh, okay so then that who do you go to to speak somewhere and and where do you like what do you do for that so i i did like i went to high schools right I uh, I started a foundation for like kids with uh, like no resources mm -hmm. to get them like equipment and you know opportunities for them to play the sport. So then, kind of like for that, you, you're creating PR too for your yourself and, sure. and you know, like whatever like your team or whatever you want to do, right? So the more exposure I had in media. Right. Like even just like interviews. Um, so how, do I, do, how do you do that? A really good relationship with reporters. How do you, you know? do that? Just like being around. I don't know. No, I, no, no. There's no being around. Somebody here is, is learning from you, figuring out how to get sponsors. And they're like, oh, yeah, just uh, hang out at the reporter bar. No, no, no. Don't <laughs> okay. hang out at the reporter bar. But I don't know, like also like traveling going to so I, I went to the olympics in greece mm -hmm. in athens as an expectator so i just hang out with like yeah like i just like hang out with the reporters yeah and then kind of how like do you, how do you how would one in their neighborhood find out where reporters hang out so that they no. can start getting stories in newspapers I don't, I don't know. It was a different time too. Like was, <laughs> social media was not big, right? So it was more about radio, TV, and magazines and written things. You know, it's, it was so different. I, I don't like right now. It's easier to get exposed and you know, like get interviews and podcasts and stuff like that. Before, I, and also you know, Guatemala is small. It's not mm -hmm. big. So, and just talking to people too. You know, I got like Oakley to sponsor me and GNC. How? <laughs> what is, what is like the conversation start? Who do you know at Oakley? Did you like email Oakley headquarters? No, 
no, no, no. I like started like to see who was the rep in in Latin America and Central America. How'd you find that out? I found I found out because I had friends that had like, you know, like just distribute Oakleys, you know, had stores or whatever. So okay. I was just like, who are you dealing with? This and that. Okay, can you can can you like I don't know like connect me in sort of way. So I started like talking and then I kind of knew when like the Latin American rep was coming to visit and I'm like, can I go to lunch with you guys? And I went to lunch and then I started a relationship with them. And then, you know, like, so Guatemala was sponsoring me and then Latin America. And then that, that went to when I started like coming to the United States to San Diego and in LA, Mm. I just started meeting people in the headquarters. So I, so that's how it all. And then that person, the Latin American Oakley rep, he he's from Venezuela. He ended up being in Quicksilver. So then Roxy Roxy sponsored me after that. Yeah, it's wow. just like, it's just relationships, you know. It's just okay. meeting people and 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 not even being pushy, you know. Just I don't know. I just been lucky, I think. <laughs> I, I I worked hard. I worked really hard. Like I I'm not yeah. gonna I'm not gonna deny that. But at the same time, you know, I, I've sometimes I've had like, for example, when I travel to Norsecas and stuff, you know, there were like better players than me at like playing all the time. And they're like, always like, how did you get Oakley? How did you get this? You know, right. I'm like, you, you, yeah. I'm, I'm guessing you just don't want to tell anybody. That's no, the- <laughs> I'm telling you the truth. Like I just like, had my, had my sponsor plan, you know, my PowerPoint that I updated all the time try to be exposed to media as much as I could because I had a marketing and advert- advertisement mm-hmm. was what I studied in college. I think here is like Stratcom or something like that. Uh, so I, I knew media. So that's mm-hmm. what I did. And I was just like, Facebook was like, not even Instagram was existed yet, but you know, I tried to have a lot of presence in media. And another thing that I did is that one of the photographers that like I had a photo shoot, he was a graphic designer and he just started working, you know, like helping me out on like creating logos and just like, like doing like really cool stuff where I, which I could present. And when I like presented to my sponsors, like, yeah, like this is how your brand is going to look. So I had like the whole layout cool. and, and like different things, like this is your brand. This has going to look like, and it was like professional stuff, you know? Mm-hmm not things that I did on my computer. So it was a professional graphic designer that made everything that helped me out. And we had like a deal, you know, like I helped him out with like some stuff and he helped me out with other, and that's how we made it work. Yeah. Hmm. All right. So reach out to media, figure out if there's a phone number somewhere on, on a newspaper, or I guess like today, you know, like if I, if I were giving advice, just send as many you know messages as you can don't don't blanket it don't exactly. you know like like when you're getting recruited to college i would say you know don't send every coach the same exact message same thing to the company like yeah. make sure that it's personal and it's personal yeah. to their company and and why there would actually be a connection there yeah and then just like i had like tons of meetings with different sponsors and most of them said no but some of them say yes. So, but yeah, it just was like sitting down, like, hey, like this, this is him, making my presentation and everything. And yeah. And I got like little money from a lot of different places, which I got, you know, our, some of our trips paid for, some others, you know, like when you, Norseka paid for like the first team and stuff like that. So mm-hmm. that was covered. Uh, but if we needed like something bigger or anything, I was able to get it or a training camp or something. Yeah. If you had, so here's what I advise against with current players uh, Mm -hmm. who are like coming up. I tell them to stop chasing sponsorships. Like don't spend time on it because to me right now, knowing the things that I know from e-commerce and like internet Mm -hmm. types of jobs, you could start building some financial platform without full-time hours that will pay you well beyond that season. And like, if you get hurt, 
So to me, I think people waste a lot of potential by sending out all of these sponsorships and talking to companies trying to get free protein powder yeah. um, instead of like, hey, you know, start a YouTube channel and just do volleyball player reacts or yeah, um, yeah or start like a for sale by Amazon or, or something where you're putting the same amount of time into researching and talking to these things. Well, put that same amount of time into developing something that will pay you no matter if you're hurt, healthy, winning or losing. I, yeah, I guess you would call that a job, but people think about a sponsorship as, you know, maybe one of the keys to being pros. And to me, it's, it's a losing battle. You know, it's only when Nike or Oakley or somebody comes to you and says, Hey, we want you on our team. And this is how much we're, we're going to give. Maybe that's coming from a big personal experience where I had a few friend and family sponsorships, you know, um, but now as a person who owns a volleyball company, I see how little benefit I could have provided to those companies, you know, yeah. with like 3000 friends and followers. Like, mm. So I don't know. I, I think more, more players now should maybe not chase the sponsorship, but what would, what would you say? Would, would you put them down your route and say like, no. this is how you do it. Go for it. No, I think it now is different. No, I think it now is completely Right. You need to create your audience, you know, you have, you need to have your, you know, like your list and make sure that you, you can have a good reach so you can start something as well. Um, but for me, it's like also like, I think it was different times and a different culture as well, you know, and there was a point that uh, I had like a person like her name was Suli Saravia back in Guatemala. She helped me a lot. And then she found me like actually like contracts, you know, like legal stuff, where, which I could you know, rely on on a monthly basis or a yearly basis. So that was that was awesome. Uh, but like, I think like first, like people need to know that you're professional, that you're trustworthy and stuff like that. And you're gonna be a good image for their brand. So making sure, I think like one of the, one of the things that I talk to my student athletes as well is like, you're building your brand forever, right? So make sure that uh -huh. you're like, social media, how the way you speak, the way you dress, the way you act, like everything, like you're dressing up, you're showing up for the job that you want, not the job that you have or the what you are right now. So just make sure that you're presenting yourself as you want people to see you in the future. You know, like it's not, you don't have to be perfect, you know, you still have to be authentic, have to be yourself, but you're selling yourself every day. Mm. Yeah. I couldn't agree with that more because you, you, you'll, you'll, you'll think of like one of those posts that popped in your mind or in your memory. And you assume that that was like the most recent thing that happened to them just because it's the most recent thing in your mind associated with that person. Yeah. You know, so even if somebody changed in the last three years, a part of you still remembers like what they were doing three years ago. And that might just shut off a phone call immediately because they did X back in 2014. So it is, it is sadly a little bit important yeah. or very important. We'll say. Yeah. It's not that you can't, you know, have fun and, you know, make mistakes and stuff like that, but just be smart and when you put it out. Right. I yeah. think that's, that's, like, because sometimes it just stays forever. It could be like a screenshot. It could be whatever. <laughs> and you, just, you just need to be careful, I think. Yeah. But, yeah. It's entrapment. <laughs> That's why it's like everything is entrapment. <sighs> yeah. All right. Back to uh, back to some, some actual volleyball. So <laughs> we're steering current players towards the same hunger and passion that you had. Um, and... If you can find sponsorships that are out there, you just got to push. But there might be for players better avenues in terms of developing relationships. And you said that relationships were absolutely the most important for, I guess, long term, right? Just yeah. being a player and a person. Mm -hmm. nice. Yeah, I know. I, I totally agree on that. Because even like just, like me being here, it was because of relationships too. You know, I got hired by a club, which they, you know, as they 
it was like Mark Lomelli back in the day. He he believed in me and he asked me if I could come and work for them. So that was, you know, because I with my club, I kind of would I was bringing kids for like fall camps and uh, spring break and stuff like that. So then they they asked me if I wanted to come and I was like, well, I don't know, you know, I have a pretty good life in Guatemala, you know, but but uh, sure, let's see how it looks. So I came for, you know, a couple of months, sat with the lawyers and see how everything would look like and just took it, you know, step by step. And I said like, okay, it's an opportunity that I can take, right? Mm -hmm. If I don't like it, I can always go back, uh, but I'm gonna do whatever it takes to make it happen. I was not even expecting it, but it happened. So I'm just gonna do whatever it takes, uh, you know, put all my mind and heart into it. And that's what I did. And here I am nine years after. And I had to get like a lot of like recommendation letters because I started coming with an O visa that is extraordinary alien in your field, which I didn't mm -hmm. think I was, but I needed to prove that, you know, the lawyers yeah. were like all this pressure on me and I had to get like so many letters so sponsors like having like um, those big companies like Oakley GNC that are international helped me, you know, uh, letters from the Olympic Committee because I was like, I was at uh, the uh -huh. Olympic Academy in Greece. I, I spoke in different things. And so uh, I had letters from the International Olympic Committee. So like all these relationships that yeah. even like they would lasted for like a couple of hours helped me to, to get here nice. so, yeah what what were you talking about for the olympic committee when you were in your speaking engagements and roles oh yes that was part of the fair play uh okay. organization so i talked about fair play and i also talked uh about women in sport so the history of women in sport yeah so it could be like title nine now here that's <laughs> like a little bit like that related but it was uh so i was part of the i earn a scholarship from the Olympic Solidarity to go to the International Olympic Academy in Greece, in Olympia, back in 2002. So that was fun. You learn about the Olympic movement, how everything started. You go to the ruins, Olympia, and you get all these talks, discussion groups, you meet people from all over the world. And it's just a lot of like education and training. And after that, you know, I just got super involved in the Olympic movement and just like gave lectures on different things, you know, for play, women in sports, uh, the Olympic uh, values and things like that. Mm. Were you trying to encourage more women's participation in sport? Is is that what you mean? Or were you giving like historical talks or what? I was mostly empowering women, I think. Okay. Yeah. Like, yes, they had like a historical context, mm -hmm. but empowering women and just making sure that, you know, we got like equal rights and equal opportunities because just coming from um, developing country, you know, like a lot of macho, right? Like soccer is the main thing there and everything else is like not good enough or, or women are look like not as athletes, but different. Mm -hmm. So just making sure that, that people respect us. That was basically it. Nice. Mm -hmm. All done. So impressive. The things that you're, done in the the way that you push it's it's bonkers and impressive there's like taking me back to the grind i'm like oh my god this is not that hard you know? <laughs> but but it is you know the things that you did automatically or whether they're through through necessity people who are in your same situation or or in the situation that you were before feel powerless yeah. and they'll get stuck and it sounds like you did it you you paid as much attention to problems or like roadblocks as you would like a pebble in the sidewalk you're like oh okay i'll just step on or over that it doesn't really affect my day <laughs> you know and and you drove through it so i think that's that's why i'm so impressed I think it was around 17 and for the indoor team so i came to practice it was his first day and he told me what are you doing here and i'm like oh i come to practice i'm like 
why? Because I'm part of the team, you know? And they're like, yeah, but like, you don't serve us. You're too short. Like that, that was like, like his words, like you don't serve us. And I'm like, okay, so, but can I stay for this practice? And he's like, okay, you can stay. But I you love that. You don't right away, that, that one yeah. sentence, that one interaction shows who you are. Yeah. So be like, it's oh, like, okay. And they would shrink and say, I'm gone. And you're like, yeah, yeah. but, <laughs> yeah, but, yeah. but I can stay today, right? <laughs> yeah. And then he's like, yeah, but you're not coming tomorrow. I'm like, okay, so I practice, right? Practice, like, I was so mad, so mad. I'm like, okay, but I'm just going to give my all. Next day, I came back, and he's like, what are you doing here? I'm like, I come to practice. Like, I told you not to come. I'm like, I know, but I'll show you that you're going to need me. And I just kept showing up, you know? And probably, like, I don't know, like, months after, like, captain selection for national team, I was his captain for three years in a row. <laughs> and it was just like, yeah, it was great. And I love him, had the best relationship with him. Every time I went to Cuba, I went to, like, had dinner with his family. And he always remembers that. But I'm like, no way. Like, but that, you know, kind of like you were like just being short. Uh being from Guatemala, you know, it's like I'm always trying to prove myself. Like, not anymore as much, but you know, like it was just a constant thing, you know, like mm -hmm. that I don't I don't need to prove myself. You know, I'm kind of like more in peace with it now, and I and I accept and I, you know, I still fight for the things that I believe and that I want to but it's not this like rage because like sometimes I was like just I was like transformed you know like, don't, I'm, like I'm just gonna do whatever it takes yeah yeah but you know what like there's like a lot of stuff that I didn't accomplish right uh as a as an athlete but I'm like I'm, I love where I'm at I love what I do I'm I I compete you know, as a coach, I mm -hmm. teach, I talk, I, I don't know, I empower people. Yeah. So it's, it's, life is good. And you're a revolutionary. I mean, to, you know, the, to be the first uh, Guatemalan beach volleyball or female beach volleyball in the world championships, which, which was like beach volleyball. first like Guatemalan period yeah. Uh, yeah. In, yeah. in beach volleyball in the world championships. It's unreal. Yeah. yeah. So being being your your stature, your height, uh, do you have specific? And I, I'm gonna try to lock you down again to specific advice for what undersized players need to do to be successful. Yes, um, you have you know you have to be really good with your footwork footwork like on everything super diligent with footwork and ball control for sure right <laughs> when you say when you say footwork do you mean your ability to change direction do you do you mean like never crossing over or never shuffling uh could you dive a little bit into a, a specific footwork sequence i think like <clears throat> being fast with your footwork right what's one thing and making sure you're efficient as well so you know like pivoting and all that stuff you know because like everything is about efficiency you know like for me to get from here to there it's a little bit harder than for someone that is six feet you know mm -hmm. so so being efficient with your footwork and and just making sure that you know like you're you're fast right you're there so you can be explosive and like when you're fast with your footwork it also like generates like the speed and then the speed generates power and all that stuff right so just um <clears throat> that ball control for sure just touching the ball as much as you can all the time having as many reps and like very mindful reps um on things like court court vision is huge making sure that you have like the best court vision stay behind the ball um learn the game but also confidence right because like sometimes as a short player, you can say like, oh, like, yeah, people look at me as I'm small, so I'm already in this advantage. Like, no, you know, I just need to work harder and that's it, you know, mm -hmm. no big deal, right? That's, uh, that's my mindset is like, like yeah, yeah, this is what I am and who I am. Yeah. So it just means that I need to work in a slightly different direction and 
just outwork them. I'll promise that I can do that, you know, and then I'll take my own path. That's not the same path as a six, nine person, but you know, I'll, I'll find my game. Yeah. And not anything perfect. You know, mm. like it's like kind of like what happened to me with that coach, you know, like I was discouraged. Yes. But it didn't make me feel less, you know, I just wanted to prove him that I was not what he was thinking of me. And so, so you just like that, you know, self-worth that you're going to have is just going to carry on, on every area of your life, not only, you know, sport, but uh, also for, you know, undersized people, like there's uh, one of the things that I really, you know, it has really stuck in me for about the Olympic movement. One of the Olympic values is the joy of effort. And it's something I talk about a lot, you know, just like, hmm. so that's one of the Olympic values, joy of effort. So you say like, yes, like I'm working my tail off, but um, I enjoy it. Like this causes me joy. Yes, I'm working more than this person, but I just enjoy it. So I just found a lot of joy in hard work not only as like like sometimes like you work hard but you kind of like have the martyr mentality or a victimize that you know i'm putting all this work you know I'm doing all this stuff and you see that consistently at every level you know club college you know high school pros every you know just like that victim mindset mm-hmm. that is not going to take you anywhere mostly because like you don't live yeah all you know? or that work is the, the crappy part yeah, exactly. Instead of like, look what you get to do. Like yeah. you get to like be in a be weight room. room. Some people don't love being in a weight room. Some people like things could be worse than you getting to throw this weight up above your head right now. You know, it yeah. could be worse than you running on a beach, you yeah. know, and, and and sprinting. Like, is this your bad? Really? Yeah. And it's our choice. We chose to be here. Like, like we could have done anything else, you know? And we chose to play and to train and to compete so why not enjoy it so yeah the joy of effort for you know undersized because you need to put a lot of work in a lot Mm. i love that and i like that because even though we're talking about you know how to be successful as maybe a shorter player that should be everybody everybody should just love showing up and if it's if it's volleyball like you don't have to put in the work look what you get to do you get to play you get to compete yeah. Yeah. I love the way you frame that. It is it is fun. <laughs> it, is, it is fun to to practice, you know. I just yeah. love practice. And I'm like, you know, there's a lot of so like we have a player, well she was a grad transfer, her name Q. We call her Q. Uh she is awesome. She travels from Tulane and she's undersized like me, and she's just a beast. You know, you see her play and it's just like so much fun and she knows, you know, she's efficient. She knows the game. She loves the game, and in yeah, two-time All-American. And so yeah, so that's so awesome. Yeah, there's a lot of really, really good undersized. Yeah, we we have less advantage, and we probably like for me, like I wanted to come to college when I was in high school, but I was playing indoor. So when I played when I was in high school, libero didn't exist. Hmm. So I was an outside hitter, super undersized. Then you saw like the internet. Like, it was like, you know, you remember when you connected by the phone and it like just pop, 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 pop. Yeah. Yeah. So you said like, there's no way you can send film, right? So you had to send like your film, like on the mail. Oh yeah. They watch you. And as soon as they said, like, saw like five, four, there's no way, no libero. Like, what are you going to do? What do you think? So I'm like, okay. So I tried though. Um, but yeah. So then I just, you know, found other ways to, to play and and to to have opportunities to nice. so what's your favorite footwork drill like what do you have a go-to footwork drill because you announced the importance of footwork so if you were to give somebody one drill right now that they should just go to the beach that would improve their footwork what would we do i like i like the star drill in the sense of like you can make it smaller or bigger or or more pivots and stuff and just train yourself to always turn to certain rounds and 
pivot, work on your pivoting, like kind of like change and modify stuff mm -hmm. all around. So For those listening, the star drill is when you place a ball, usually a ball in each corner of the court and a ball in the middle. And you have to go corner, middle, next corner, middle, next corner, middle. Okay. Yeah, yeah. This, the, the good thing about that, I think that it helps you work on accelerate, acceleration, deceleration, pivoting, you know, everything, right? And like kind of like court awareness because you want to always like turn facing the net, stuff like that, and pivot. So it could be, and you can do it smaller. You can you, you can work on like a little bit of endurance too with it. Uh, so yeah, I would say that like nothing to complicate it. Mm. Yeah. Nice sprint, stop, start. Yeah. Love. Like I think it's super basic. Everyone knows how to do it. You just have to do it right. You know, stay low. You know, work on like that. You know, steps, the pivoting, and all that. Yeah, I think that would be like my favorite. And train yourself to do it at max velocity. Like make your turns quicker. How quick can you make the turn, the stop exactly. and the start? Yeah. So the, that stopwatch is probably a real nice thing to have so that you can hold yourself accountable. Yes, true. Are yeah. there any are there any tests aside from let's say star drill and vertical jump that you think like physical tests that you think are really truly important to the game that aside from vertical jump and uh maybe a timed agility race is there any stats or or attributes that you think should should be measured and worked on yeah i think in the way like, like the, the speed of the bar how fast you can move the bar you know like there's um, i don't know how's it called like when you can actually do it you know we do it here and and it, it helps you to see how how fast you're moving if like if they're like peak if we have them like peak for competition or not you know like mm -hmm. not only really, you know during you know before we hit competition like the week of, comp of playing or the day before you know how fast that bar is moving to see if we are actually hitting the right amount of load and the load so so the players are explosive enough mm -hmm. to play do you have a measurement for that? Do you have a, a machine that does that? Yes, I can send it. I don't know how's it called, but yes, we do have a machine for that. Okay. Yeah. And mm -hmm. uh, the one we had at Velocity, it just like sat on the ground. It was a magnet. And then it tied like basically a Velcro strap mm -hmm. to the bar and it just measured it. But I remember them being like, I don't know, a thousand bucks or two thousand yeah, bucks. Yeah, it is. Or I was like, Ugh, yeah. I don't want to yeah. do that. Yeah, it is expensive. But yeah, maybe I can find out like some other ways to do it but i think like measuring that it's it's good just to see if, like you're not because like back in the day too like we used to overtrain and you were not like efficient at all right yeah. so so yeah like training is good but also smart you know being smart about your training and that's you know something that you learn with time you know and and the game changer for me that was game changer to to learn how to lift better and mobility and diet and all that stuff cues too mm -hmm. people forget about that bar speed that when you're squatting and you're on your way up doesn't count or it doesn't matter as much if you can get it up it matters mm -hmm. how fast you can get it up and even if you're you're moving slow but you're moving as fast as you possibly can at each point in that move, you know, whether it's a, a, a deadlift uh, in RDL, you know, don't take it from a slack bar and then just try to do it. Like make sure your core is engaged and yeah. um, you're lift, lift the bar basically a millimeter off the ground and then fire. But the effort to move your squats at maximum speed pays off in such a huge way, you know, controlling how fast that you can actually fire. Because if you get it up, but you could have moved faster, guess what? You're going to jump the, the exact same way. You're going to jump in a way that you could have jumped higher with just the conscious effort of training that way. Teaching the athletes how to engage their core, how to, you know, like use the right muscles, how to be aware of the muscles that you're using, like all that stuff, you know, like when you're, when you can control it, right? Because once we're out on the court, it's like, you know, you're focusing on your game, not not much on like, what are you 
you know, you're engaging your muscles or not. Yeah. Right. Well, uh, Maho, is there anything that, that you guys are working on or any new, new projects or new companies, um, or places that you're going to speak that people can, can keep up with you? Well, for now, um, no, I'm working on, I want to start a club or academy here at Network. So I'm excited about that and I hope I can make it happen. What's, could you say it again? There was a little feedback there. Little feedback there. Oh, like I want to start a, you know, a club or an academy here in Fort Worth where I live. Uh, so yeah, I'm excited about that. So I'm just trying to, 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 you know, like there's a lot of compliance stuff now that, I, you know, I work here. I have run like three different clubs, which has been amazing, but, you know, just with all these rules, it's a little tougher, but mm -hmm. not impossible. So I've, you know, I've had some conversations with places that I could start and, and just, you know, I don't know. I just want to reach more people, right? And as you know, you know, beach volleyball, we're not, you know, like one of the sports that we make tons of money, you know? I feel that, you know, like I, I'm happy here and, you know, the, the school is awesome and, and everything. But at the same time, you, you're always like striving for a little bit more, I think. And mm -hmm. I can reach out to more, more girls or boys or. Nice. Cool. <laughs> and what's the, uh, the future or at least maybe the next few weeks of TCU beach volleyball look like? Like, uh, well, you know, uh, right now girls are summer, so we don't see them. So <laughs> classes starts, start in ag August. Uh, we're really excited about the next season. The season was awesome for us. We were, two matches away from the all time record of most wins in a season by anyone. We were whoa, down whoa. by two matches. Yes, we, we, we got to 39 wins this season. So that was pretty cool. Wild. Uh, yeah, we we had a pretty good season. Then the postseason, we didn't do as well. You know, things didn't turn out the way we wanted uh, at nationals, but it is what it is. We'll come back stronger next year, and and we have a great group of girls that are coming back and new that are coming. So, oh, just excited, you know, like working and seeing what this you know new group brings. What do you are you allowed to tell us what you tell your girls during the off season? What they should be working on, you know, should they be on the sand as much as possible? Should they be in the weight room watching film as much as possible? Should they just decompress i think like everyone has different uh needs something different you know some of them are like playing a lot internationally we have some international girls that are playing a lot on the tour and uh, european championships ships and stuff like that we encourage everyone to play as much as they can during the during the summer to get that you know like playing experience plus that we have such a long uh, you know, like off season, you know, the fall and then our season is so short then, yeah. Why don't you play during the summer? Right? <laughs> yeah. uh, everyone, you know, like I think like I am a true believer that everyone, it doesn't matter what level you're playing at, should be working on their strength training regardless okay. all the time. You know, you, you really, really need to work on being strong, being mobile, being efficient, all that, like that should be just must. Mm. Part and of do, your daily habits. Do you guys utilize Olympic lifts with your team, yeah. or is it? Yeah, you do. Okay, because yeah. not a lot of teams do. Some strength coaches are like, "Yes, we could." Yeah, my, my strength <laughs> coach in college, he's like, he he wasn't willing to sacrifice the amount of time that yeah. it would take to teach you to do it efficiently. So yeah. he just created high velocity movements without needing the actual technical coaching of Olympic lifting. Yeah, we don't like it's not the base. They're incorporated, but it's not the base on it. You know, like we do cleans, and but it's not that, you know, like we always do that. You know, there's a lot of single leg stuff, a lot of balance, a lot of body weight things, you know, like pull ups and, and things. A lot of, we do a lot of, uh, I think, like also when I was like working at uh, Jackson Strength, super big on shoulder um, strength and mobility. Uh, so making sure that you're mobile, you're scap, you know how to, you know, like how to 
move your scaps and fire up like all those muscles uh, you know work on your lats like all that stuff it's mm -hmm. just things that you you know like you learned as a player mostly having shoulder issues yep. <laughs> uh going to pt consistently yep. so just trying to make sure that you prevent injuries and prevent you know like either chronic or or how do you say or traumatic injuries yeah for the most part yeah, I like that for shoulder mobility plus strength, just the holding the plate mm -hmm. and yeah. then just doing the wrap around the head. I think for the people who can't do it, it's a it's a big sign like, hey, mobility mm -hmm. needs to be upgraded. Like you have to be able to get your tricep behind your ear, you know, yeah. if you want to swing hard ever. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. that's one of my favorite shoulders, just the wrap around the head. I think that's a nice, calm, not crazy, but valuable exercise. Yeah, and then you, you also need to understand that you're an overhead sport, right? Like you don't train like football or other players. Like it's completely different. So if you can do more like single arm, you know, land my press, like working the press like that instead of like like bench pressing or mm -hmm. you know, just making sure that you're really protecting your shoulder as much as possible and strengthening at it at the same time. So making sure that I think like every program should – to have those like conversations with their strength coaches, you know, that if they know the difference of like how to train an overhead sport. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Or they could just come to Better Beach and get our 60 day program and we'll cover it for you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, you um, gotta get a little bit of everything or a lot of everything. We've got a lot of everything. It's, it's uh, been like how long has it been? Or it's been a while, right? That you well, started. So <laughs> Bali Camp Hermosa started in 2015. Um, that was when we were just doing like vacations and inviting players out to California. And then, you know, I, I started looking at my hourly and and what I could, how many players I could actually reach in one hour. And if I want to pay attention to players and actually get involved in their lives. I can only have somewhere between eight and 12, you know, max per court. Mm -hmm. I was like, I have the ability to have a, a bigger, deeper reach into the sport mm -hmm. and to help way more people and teach way more people, you know, with that one hour. And so like right now, this, you know, each, each of our episodes right now gets about 600 downloads and I'm sure that'll keep, keep, keep growing. So in this hour, like how many athletes have I now coached or taught or presented more and better information to um, than I could in one hour of, of actual coaching? So I figured in, in terms of power per, per coach or power per hour, like w I have the ability to affect more lives doing it this way. And um, so now I, I coach coaches and soon, hopefully, I'll be able to, to coach like small business owners and things like that. Um, but this has been... Man, right at the start of COVID, uh, we were working on stuff for like six months in advance of that. Mm -hmm. And so we were, we, we thought we were ready to be a fully online company. Uh, and now, what is it, three, three years later, it's like we're not even close to being done. <laughs> yeah. So uh, it's, been a, it's been a trip, that's for sure. But it's great. You know, you're like providing a lot of good content and yeah, you, you are expanding your your audience which is awesome and then also you know i i love the one-on-one -on -one, face to face but you know like i think like we are meant to reach out more so i think you're doing you're doing something really great thank you much appreciated I've so always, I've always admired you. oh thanks Maho. same back yeah. at you for sure <laughs> Yeah, the, you're like, the you're way like, you handle obstacles, quote unquote. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, we're gonna say goodbye to these lovely people, Maho mm -hmm. and TCU. Thanks for your conversation, TCU. Thanks for sharing her. Um, and good luck this season. You know, I'll see you at coaching clinics on the beach, wherever. But. Best of luck in everything you do, and, and thanks for your time and hanging out. Yeah, thank you so much, and hopefully I see you summer. I'll be up in California for like about 10 days, so. Perfect. Yeah. We're here.
and thanks for having me. Like, oh my god, like I went back and like <laughs> about all this stuff. So. Trip down memory lane. Yeah. Yes, 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 yes. Cool. All right. Cool. Well, you, you have a great day. Okay, same. Everybody else, we'll see you on the sand. Bye.